Well, welcome everybody to the Quantum Link Reloaded Talk. Uh, I'm Keith Henriksen, and I was sort of the first person to open that project up, although I certainly didn't uh, have that name. I'm not the one that created that name. So I'm going to talk a little bit about me, how I got into Quantum Link, the first breaks in the protocol when we started to understand what was going on between the 64 and the non-existent server. A little bit about Quantum Link Reloaded being born and then what the future holds for this whole project. I signed up to Quantum Link the same day I got my modem. It was probably Christmas 1986. Finished opening the presents. My dad and I went upstairs, plugged the modem into the computer, figured out how to get the phone line from my parents' bedroom to my bedroom, <laughs> and totally failed to sign into Quantum Link. Uh, for some reason, they were having some technical problems Christmas morning. And once we did get through later that day, it was back when you had to voice validate. So you kind of entered your information and then three days later, someone from customer service would call you up and say, did you actually sign up for this account? Oh, you did? Cool. So that kind of ruined Christmas morning. <laughs> but in the end, I got on and it was my first experience online. I was like, this is going to be the future. I had no idea how good the future was going to be as far as being online, how much you were going to be able to do. But at the time, you could talk to people, you could get access to resources that you really wouldn't on your own. You could upload, I think it was GeoWrite documents, and they would laser print them and mail them to you, which saved a lot of money on buying a laser printer. And you know, somewhere in the 90s, my parents got me a PC and canceled Quantum Link and signed up for AOL. And I figured out really quickly that AOL was Quantum Link ported to the PC. But that ran out and I was on the real internet and never looked back. About 2000, I started talking with a coworker and tell him how much I had liked Quantum Link and how much I wanted to get recreate it how much I wanted to see it live again and I started picking his brain you know what kind of things would you have to do and he wasn't a 64 guy but we were both programmers and we kind of talked where the problems would be I eventually decided I needed to do this I am just one of many people that made this possible uh, there's at least a couple of people in the room that were invaluable in doing this and they have carried the torch on at a time when I couldn't and I, my hat is really off to them. I do think of the people that came before me and I know there were people before me. I was probably the first to have something of every area of Quantum Link decoded. You could get to the main menu and you could go to the BBS section and you could go to people connection. And that was kind of where I left off. So somewhere late 2000, early 2001, just based on where I was living, which roommates were there at the time. That was when I come home on a Friday night and I go, I'm bored. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to reinvent Quantum Link. That was an interesting decision to do with my Friday night. But at that point, I got layer two decoded and layer three, I had some commands understood over the next year or two. And I reached out to various Quantum Link fan sites. I'm like, hey, I've got this replacement Quantum Link server. And I know I did not explain this well because I did not seem to find anyone really interested in what I was doing. It wasn't until 2005 that I found Petsky forums and they were already working on a project. And I said, well, I can give you a head start on this thing because I've got a couple of servers that prove what's going on. 
somewhere that year the service went live. We had a launch at Strap that uh, Jim Brain conducted, and I did a launch at VCF West. And on and off for the next several years, all of us, several of us, worked on making this thing better. Unfortunately, in 2010, I had a great idea. I was going to quit my job and write iPhone apps and become independently rich. That did not happen. But I really didn't have the time to devote to things that weren't going to make money. I had to put food on the table. When the, that money ran out, I had to take any job I could, and I was working for a company that had a notoriously overburdensome non-compete that said so much as talking at your kid's school about how great your kid is would violate your non-compete. And needless to say, there was going to be no more quantum link work. So at that point, I dropped out of the project and that sort of accounts for 11 years of my life and now i'm back into it or would like to get back into it so we go back we're 2000 2001 friday night what do i have i have quantum link d64 which was someone imaged one of the original quantum link discs and uploaded to the internet i had vice this would be about 1.12 and it was very limited in its serial implementation, but it did allow you to hook the user port RS-232 where the modem would have plugged in on 64 to standard in, standard out of a program. I think this was under Linux. And that meant the server clone was really going to consist, at least initially, of printf, scanf, fgets. I am far more of a C programmer than any other language. I admit this. So when I started reverse engineering, I said, what do I know? Because there's a lot I don't know and I could get overwhelmed, but I need to know what do I know? And I knew the dialer was in basic because I had played around with how the disc worked when I was a kid, not that I understood what I was looking at. I did notice that the basic program, you couldn't just load it off the disc for some reason. It was corrupted missing characters. It was, it was very odd. And I knew that there was this whole chain of things that had to be in memory at once. So there couldn't be that much code involved in this. It was a big, long disk load, as would be familiar to a Commodore owner. It would automatically dial the modem, make the X25 connection, log in. There was a very brief disk access, so you weren't really loading program code at that point. And the main menu would show up. And so I'm like, this is all in memory at once, but then there'd be another disk load. So I knew I was going to have more to understand. So there are some terms that I am going to use the green screen, which really is where it handles dialing the modem, making the X25 connection to Virginia at the time. That's where the servers were. The blue screen where you're logging in system messages, account setup surveys, that type of thing. And then there's the main menu, and we all know what that is. So it's a big basic program. I knew that. So I just loaded Quantum Link up normally, as you would have as any user in device. And I used the monitor to search through memory, and I found the start of the program. At that point, you just say reset basic. Reset my reset vice and you say poke 44 comma 19 because that is the decimal version of the 13 hex there on the high byte and boom we can list the program and it lists great as long as you let quantum link load it so i said okay start need to start identifying major parts of the program there's a whole bunch of pokes and peaks and craziness up there, and it's very hard to know what they mean. So I started looking for things that I recognized. And we see we've got to go sub to 40,000. We got 
one of several Go subs to uh, nine nine hundred, that sort of thing. Got a couple more pokes. Got an SYS. I'm like, okay, maybe maybe let's start looking at the basic code. Basics always easier to reverse engineer than assembly. Forty thousand is the modem dialer. If you, once you see things like AT, ATD, plus, 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 you're talking to a modem, which is understandable. So we need to somehow pass this 40,000 code. How do we make it skip it? Could write a modem emulator, that would take me a while, or we could cheat. Other manual dial modems. Today, we're still saying, I believe they say other command-driven modems. I don't remember if there's any precise technical differences, but we skipped the whole modem dialer and I didn't have to write any code. Now we have to emulate the X25 service. So Quantum Link did not own their own modems. That was not practical to own a nationwide network. So they went to companies, TimeNet, Telenet, Datapack, there are a couple others out there, but I believe they supported those three. Datapack was Canada. The other two handled the U.S. And then they had a big X25 network, and that was a telecom standard that mostly doesn't exist anymore. We'll get into one trivia tidbit about it. And they would then run these bulk data lines to Virginia, and that saved the long-distance fees, which at the time, this was mid-80s, would have been exorbitant for them to pay to the phone company. These services were much cheaper. So I'm looking through the code and I go, okay, I see this thing in here about identifier. And I'm like, why do I remember identifier being part of the TimeNet command set? Not that I ever signed into TimeNet directly, just something something rings a bell. I'm like, okay. And if I recall, you I knew that when you logged into Quantum Link, when you spe configured it, you had to specify the phone number with a character in front of it. And that said which X25 service you were going to use because they were all different command sets. And I said, I think slash was TimeNet. So I think if I say slash 5512, it's going to call this code. Now I know when I pass that 9700 code. Well, if we call SYS 50489 up here, we realize the screen looks very different. The top half is uppercase graphics, the lower half is lowercase. We've got a typing bar at the bottom that's taken over our keyboard. So we're gonna see something very different on the screen when we have gotten there to line 610. So we're looking out for that. After really what amounts to trial and error, I created the first version of Quantum Link Reloaded. That's it. <laughs> that passes the X25 connection. What that meant coming in from TimeNet, or if it even was TimeNet or Telenet or Datapack, I have no idea. I simply found if you put a slash, and you sent those characters, you're good to go. And then we get from that green screen to the blue screen. We know we've called that SYS statement on 610 because again, we have our typing bar. We have some graphics at the top. We have uppercase, lowercase in the bottom half of the screen. We know that we've gotten there. Okay. So I said, okay, that's cool. First time in seven years, someone's maybe seen this as far as I knew it that at that time. Now we want to pass another check. There's got to be another check in here because I know that SYS 50489 does not block. So we're not stuck there. We're doing some more go subs, but I see here we've got a routine at 650. We're going to call some machine code at 39616. We're going to return a value from 782, which is actually 
means the routine has left the vein in the Y register, and BASIC will be able to pick that up from 782. The code is going to loop until that's a 0 or a 10. And I said, OK, let me just guess. What would that be? An error counter? Probably an error counter. I'm going to guess that's an error counter. 10 errors, that doesn't sound good. I want that value to be 0. Is that just a guess? That's just a guess. It's a hypothesis. Let's test it. Scientific method. So we're going to look at some assembly. I promised to hold down the amount of assembly we have to look at, but we do have to get into some. So 39616 is to an assembly programmer in hex is 9AC0. And basically it's going to save the memory of bank configuration of the 64. It's going to flip basic ROM out of the way so it can see the RAM underneath it. It's going to read a single byte into that Y register, so was, my theory is correct. It's going to put the memory back, and it's going to return to BASIC. So really, this is a peak. On the 128, you'd say bank zero, peak, this memory location. 64 did not have the bank command, so we have to do it in assembly. That location holds one. I said this thing really looks like an error counter. So I want it to be made at zero. How can I do that? Well, when we look at B5, we look, we know that we're reading B9, B5, 6502 stores its addresses backwards, B5, B9, and we get a whole bunch, about six places that it could be. Some of those are total red herrings. Those bytes just randomly showed up in memory. Some of them, they're reading it. They're not at all helpful. Very quickly, I found this guy. And we are looking at more assembly here. And I should take my glasses off so I can point to the right thing. And that is load accumulator with zero, store accumulator into that B9B5 address. I said, I'd like this code to run. So where does this routine start? Where, where, where did this come in from? It's always hard to tell in 6502 code. So the best thing to do is look up for a return to RTS, a return, or a jump. Usually routines end in one of those. And we see a jump. I don't see any branches up here that would branch down to the below here. So BB27, it's a good theory. Let's check that out. We look for someone doing a jump to BB27, and bingo, we land here. So we're doing some comparisons against a series of values. To a C programmer, this is a switch statement. And I, even at the time, was working in networking, and I said, I don't write a lot of networking code without using a switch statement. We're looking at a packet processor. But what does a packet look like? What, how do I get this byte accepted? So a lot of hunting around, and eventually I found this two-byte comparison here. Really, that's all it's doing is comparing two bytes. And, or two 16-bit values is the way I should say that. And I said, well, I recall reading on the internet that Quantum Link used CRCs. 16-bit is a fine CRC for 80s. I'll bet that's a CRC comparison, just, just to guess. So I said, well, what if it fails? Maybe that will tell me. Maybe maybe that failure code will tell me something. So if it's not equal, we go to B8BC. From B8BC, we go to BACA. That goes through a bunch more steps. And we end up at this 9A00 routine. This guy looks strange. It looks complicated, but it's in fact the keys to the kingdom because we have we're going to specify our client version number right here. We know that we're sending a packet 23. And if we were to dig into this, I won't make everyone look at more assembly than I have to. That's a CRC calculation. 
well, let's say it's a checksum calculation. And I said, I think I know what a quantum link packet looks like. End Friday night. Late. Very late. Saturday morning, I wake up and I run to Fry's Electronics for a null modem cable. This is when you could actually buy electronic components at retail and not have to wait two days for Amazon. So I bring it home and I plug COM1 and COM2 together through a null modem cable. I tell Vice to attach to COM1. I rewrote the server emulator to talk to COM2, run standard in, standard out. Now I can printf what I'm doing. Now I can see live logging of what I'm doing rather than just that printf that goes into the clients and I can't see what's going on. This gave me the first packet. And I said, well, that's a lot of bytes. So what did it all mean? Well, after chasing into it, I found 5A is always set on any packet. It's simply a header character. This is the checksum and the sort of bit packet. They're the nibble packet so that it will never have an invalid value. There's a couple of reserved values in the protocol that you don't ever want to send. And they just stuff a one, a four, a one, and a four. Why not always four? I don't know. <laughs> These bytes surprised me. I did not expect to see them there. I had no idea what they were. There was my pack at 23. There was this thing that looked like a version number. And we have an end of line. Carriage return. I said, that's a packet. And again, I saw where one of the Planet engineers was commenting somewhere on the internet that they use CRC. But the code wasn't, that checksum code wasn't using the right values for a CRC 16. So instruction by instruction, I transliterated the 6502 code to C. Wrong. It took me six hours to find an and and where I needed an and. And the really frustrating part is if I had known that CRC 16 did everything in a backwards bit order for some reason, it is just CRC 16. I could have been done with this so much faster. But there we were. So I said, well, now I can validate a packet, which means I can send one. So I sent my 5A. I sent my calculate my checksum. I, again, I had no idea what these guys were. And I had looked up, how do we call that? Well, we need to send a packet 24. That was what I figured out of that giant switch statement. And again, we'll send an end of line character. Ran the server again. Yeah, <laughs> this was a moment uh, I knew. I was like, no one's seen this. Nobody has seen this. And I hadn't seen it in six, seven years at that point. Luckily, things get saner. For the most part, we're going to drop out of the assembly language land because the actual machine code that runs it is 4K of self-modifying code that is, it's not evil, just really beautifully written. But <laughs> explaining beautifully written code, I don't even understand most of it. So, but again, let's, let's look at basic. Basic is so much easier reverse engineer. So we are going to call, we know that we got down here because we have seen changes to the screen. We need to pass this loop here. We are going to read 246. We must read 246 from the assembly code. How do we do that? Go sub 2000, it pulls a value from the assembly language code. Go sub 15,000 animates the quantum link logo. I figured that out pretty quick. It, it does a rainbow scroll effect across. And so it's just calling that repeatedly. That's easy. So I said, okay, so if we need that to be 246, let's go into the assembly code. Well, that's a ring buffer, and the code that puts it into the ring buffer is, again, 4K of really, really tightly coded assembly. 
And I think a lot of people, from what I've seen, tried to go that route. And if you don't have a base for where you are, it's, I don't think you can. It just wasn't the one I did figure out. I was not going to want to do that. So the data packet that was being sent, let's take a look at that. We've got our static header character. We got a checksum. I still don't know what it is, but the values have changed. So we'll send it. We got our packet type 20. All the packet types are in the 20s. We've got DD, could be a command token. We've got an account number. We've got four characters that I think on that first pass, they were garbaged out characters. And I said, password, something? I don't know. You never had a password in Quantum Link. It was loaded, it was stored on the disk. And we have our end of line. So what do I send a response to a DD? First thought was, well, I'll just send every possible response. That was at least 36 squared. Since they use punctuation, it's more than that. I said that's not what I want. Well, what we, searching before helped. Let's let's search through memory again. And I found a list of two character codes that does not include DD and a list of two character codes that does. And I said, I think I have a list of codes I can send and a list of codes I can receive. So write them all down and try the ones that we can receive. So I really made a set of notes that looks like this. DD, I sent response SS, no reaction. Change the code to send to DO, redo the entire thing, it's load in from scratch. This one was interesting, the screen cleared down, but then the client locked up completely. And I said, well, that wasn't what I wanted. But we'll write it down. We don't know what it did. We, we know it did something. DK printed an invalid account number or password. DA gives you already signed in. At that point, the only thing the client lets you use F5 and it reboots the computer. Whole bunch of them had no reaction. I'm skipping some ones in the middle that had no reaction. The DQ, spending limit, DX, account has been invalidated. And then D3 something different happened. Every time you signed on to Quantum Link, you would see this message after your account was verified, you would see your disk as being validated. I didn't know what it meant, but I was looking at it. So I said, the screen's familiar. It sends me an SS and then again, it's waiting for something. What do you say to an SS? Well. We have an SS in the list of commands that the client will accept. Didn't do anything before, try it now. And the disk ran very briefly and then replied with the D6. I go, okay. <laughs> so we'll write that down. But I'm thinking, did I, did I get somewhere? Well, if we go back to the basic program, we're gonna call this go sub 2000. Or, yeah, let's see, yeah, it's the go sub 2000 here. No, go sub 3000, that's the one. Go sub 3000. And that is going to call an SYS routine from basic that makes the disk run. And I said, well, I know the disk ran because I saw the emulator do that. And I can then guess I've crossed this point. So progress is made. Then the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. The way the DO command cleared the screen reminded me of the way the client transitioned to the main menu. Every time it would do this really weird effect of turn down and parts at the same time. So well, it locked up the client before, but we hadn't sent that D3 command. State is usually very important to programs. I knew the client was sending me a D6 once it was validated, so set the server up to respond to a D6 with a DO. And that was sometime late on Saturday. Again, probably very late, maybe Sunday morning by this point. <laughs> but we got there. Now, to be clear, Quantum Link was not written in a weekend. The logging code does not work right. 
if you experiment with more than a handful of commands, the computer will stop responding to any messages. If you ask the computer to send more than a handful of messages, it will get stuck. So there was a lot to learn. And a lot of it was in that layer two code, those packet 21, 22s, 23s. So we'll say that after the next couple of weeks, I learned some more about it. And one thing I learned was this number sent, number received was what these two bytes are now. It's a really common networking strategy for sequencing packets. So you go, every time you send a packet, you increment your number sent by one. Then every time you respond to a, you send, you also send your number received, which is what's the highest numbered message I have acknowledged from the other guy. Now, if he sees your number sent come in, you go one, two, three, five. He can go, wait, 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 where's four? Where's four? I don't see it. And he needs to buffer it. You need to buffer it. So when he says, oh yeah, I've gotten five you can clear packets one, two, three, four, and five. You don't have to hold those in your buffer anymore because they'll never be asked for, for a retransmission. That took me a while to figure out, and this is where I said there's a funny bit with X25. I was writing our ISDN protocol stack at the time because while it never made it to the home market, it did get used for PBXs for a long time. It's probably still used for PBXs. And ISDN also has this. So I was looking at number sent, number received every day at work and took, again, a couple of weeks to realize Quantum Link was doing the same thing. And I said, well, they were familiar with X25. X25 became ISDN. I should have assumed that this layer would look very ISDN-ish. And once I did compare it to ISDN layer two, I said, every message is here. <laughs> they changed it a bit. They simplified it but it is the same strategy. They're doing the same job. So this is where we learned 21 and 22, because anytime you send a packet, you have to understand that packet could need to be retransmitted. These X25 connections drop messages, modems drop messages, corruption occurred. So you had to buffer them. And if your buffer filled up, you could always say, Packet 21 saying my retransmission is full, packet, and the other guy responds packet 22. 25 is a sequence error. So if you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you say packet 25, number received is 3, and he'll start over from 4. Packet 26 is we don't want to send messages. Every message you send over those X25 connections, you pay for. So if we don't have to send a message, we don't want to. But then we have no way to tell when the connection's dropped. So 26 is a keep alive. Every so often, if we haven't sent something, we'll send a 26 and the other guy responds with a 24. And there's some comments in my, my versions of the server that don't quite line up with my understanding of this. So someday I may need to take a look at that. So that got us through the login section. There's more things in there, but now we got to get into people connection and the non-chat areas. Each one of those, I forget precisely how many it is, but it's 50 to 70 commands. Sending those one by one would have been crazy. So we're going to blunderbuss. We're going to send a whole bunch of commands if we can think of the right ones to send. So when you say as a user, I want to join the Commodore Information Network, the client eventually sends K1 and then this add, 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 I. So I'm like, well, I see in my responses, I've got K, KB, KC, D, key. There's KF, KG. There's a few more of them, actually. But I said, let me send a whole bunch of these. And I'll give each one a different message, and I'll see what shows up on the screen, if anything. The client only prints two lines, and it's clipped the front of those lines, it's clipped the first eight characters. Also, the menu options aren't selectable. The client's kind of confused, that's obvious. So I started looking at screenshots people had made of Quantum Link, and I said, oh, every one of these has a spaces in front of the name. 
there's sort of the option. I said, I'll bet I have to send those spaces. And I've got these eight characters. I don't know what good they do. So <laughs> add, add, I, I put in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, four spaces. And again, two different lines, KB. And client tells me there's too many lines. Now I see the full message. The checkbox moves, but the option gives an error. So a little bit more testing here. The way Quantum Link signals the end of a data transmission is it has two commands for every type of data. So menu has two, text file has two, online messages have two, and there's each line before the last, and then you have a separate command for the last line, and that saves having a done packet being sent all the time. Because again, they'd have to pay a couple of cents for that done packet. They were literally billed per packet. So that's why it's KA and KB, is KB just says, I'm now sent the whole main menu. So what are these four character codes? So Vice has watch points in the debugger. You can tell when data has been simply accessed. And I knew where the packet was stored in memory. Yeah, well, it was being processed, so set a watch point on those characters. Eventually, I end up with the routine at 8F11. Blocks have converted to four characters to three bytes each. This is really what Base64 does on the web today. The character set's different because it uses the Commodore character set, but the job is identical. One block is just saved to memory and replayed when the option is selected. That's your link. That's how they handled links. They weren't URLs. They were 24-bit quantities. So there were 16 million unique documents that could be on the Quantum Link service at one point. The other block is interpreted a little more complicated. So you specify the data type that you're linking to in the menu item rather than like on the web today, once a document starts coming in, the first thing you get is the MIME type that says, here's what time document you're getting. You actually had to specify that on the link with quantum link. Not sure that one of those is better than the other. Mm -hmm. I think it told the client, I gave the client a little bit of preparation. But you had to help menu text file. Some of these, I say blank screen because we still don't know what they actually do. Some of them are predefined menus, the post office, the switching to a new area. Those were all stored, hard-coded into the Quantum Link client. And they just said, this is the thing you're going to, and there's nothing accessed from the service to do that. So the other two bytes. Byte 2 is not used, and byte 3 stores the plus time status. You can say, do not change state. Area is a free area. Area is a plus time area, or area is a minus time area. And I never worked out if that one was a glitch or they deliberately wanted another character there. Lather, rinse, repeat. Basically, the next year was doing that. Sending a whole bunch of commands, seeing which ones cause some reaction on the screen, using the debugger to dig through it, that's where we kind of, and that would be if I thought to use it. There were certain commands never did understand. EW, email waiting, set your mail waiting indicator. AOL probably used the same command. So every time you hear that guy, there's the command. I figure out people connection, people connection games, online message systems, system messages. I wrote two servers in that time. The C1 had more features, but it really required, it could, it, it did not do well at a dynamic system. It was hard to modify. C++, everything was kept in a MySQL database, which is a great start, but I never implemented most features because I was, again, working just to make myself happy. So that's, that's hard with no one kind of feeding back into it. Again, no one was interested at this point. People weren't even sure what I was doing when I reached out to them. So I said, well, maybe it was a dumb idea. And I kind of went back in my box and I put it down until 
Quantum Link Reloaded began. I was looking for something else. I don't remember what I was actually looking for. I found the Petsky forums, and they're discussing Quantum Link and maybe recreating it. And I said, well, I've got two servers. <laughs> and there was a lot of confusion about that as to who I was. <laughs> and I'm like, just some dude, 24-year-old kid <laughs> sitting here <laughs> on a Friday night writing servers. And at this point, really, other people stepped up to the plate in a way that I never could have. I would not have been that helpful. Jeff Ledger, he owned the Petsky Forums, and he was one of the first people to validate that I had succeeded. Jim Brain, sitting there in the back of the room, he was able to also confirm I wasn't full of it. And then he started writing an actual server in Java that actually worked. He handled the launch. Raymond Day showed up at some point. I don't know that I've met him. And he had, right in the last days of Quantum Link, before the server went down, he had captured binary logs of all the traffic going to the between the server. There were questions in there we would never have figured out. The way forum posts work, it it's a linked list and it has a special command that says update the head of the linked list to this item. And it's used to handle the races between all the various clients doing posts at the same time without having a huge lock on the server. I've never worked out if you could create a forum post that linked to some other random area by specifying some other code. But again, I've never seen the Quantum Link server. IT support on this thing when we did the VCF West. Uh, we had the person that knew where all the power circuits ran got stuck in traffic in the Bay Area because that's what happens in the Bay Area is you can get stuck in traffic on a Saturday. And he was there really just as my moral support. And he goes, I'm an IT guy. We have an IT problem. And he goes over to them, would you like some help? Yes, we're short people. Okay. <laughs> All of a sudden, extension cords are coming. Here's This is from Jason. Here's an Ethernet cable. It's from Jason. I'm like, would not have helped fix this for him. And he fixed it for other people. There was a guy with a home-built CPU and the power crypt tripping out for him. And would not that launch would not have happened. So what's next? Is there more to do? Well, there's several kinds of retro computing. People that are preservationist. They want artifacts to put in a museum, to have artifacts in a museum just to see that they're preserved and we're not there. We don't have the whole thing. So we could give them more. The Augmentus likes the look of retro software, but they want the modern conveniences. They want their games to load super fast off an SD card, but they really do like the older stuff. Problem with making them happy with Quantum Link is it's never gonna be graphically based. It's never going to be the web. It doesn't have that power. Then there's the nostalgist that still lives in the 80s. Their house looks like they live in the 80s. <laughs> and they might actually be an actual user base. I think we're, most people in the community are probably some combination of these three. So the ones we can probably make the happiest are the preservationists. Quantum Link's disk format, it's velar. It's just like Geos. The files that are loaded are pointing to various streams. Each stream can have chunks. Each chunk can have a compression type. And I do know all those compression types. At one point, I wrote an extractor. I have since lost the code. But it can be stored. There's an RLE compression that handles like single byte patterns. There's one that's Huffman-like. It's not really Huffman, but it does the same job. It reduces the bit depth. It's not that hard to figure out again if I wanted to. The login info is stored on track 18 sector 15. It's on a directory sector. That's why you should never add files to your quantum link disk because if you add enough, you will eventually blow away your login info. We want to, we'd want to move this to a file. We'd have to update change access to write config data to a new file, update login to write a config data to a new file. People have asked for SwiftLink 232 support, Turbo 232 support. We'd probably need Ymodem support and probably a new logo. 
make the nice Quantum Link Reloaded logo that's actually just a bunch of C64 sprites when it shows up. So they're stored there somewhere. All those would be possible. To get to that museum quality, though, you would have to write a decompiler. There's a huge state machine. That's what I was referring to as that 4K self-modifying code. It parses a somewhat P code, somewhat state machine thing. And all of these commands that we don't yet understand, the answers are in there. And that's what we'd have to get at. Then write up proper Q-Link documentation, not notes, not servers and then we'd have a museum piece do i have time to do any of that i'd like to do some of it but the more people that are interested the more motivation there is to get this project moving again and that is the end of my presentation so does anyone have any questions we have plenty of time here Yes. I don't want to get too far out into the weeds because um, I know it's a whole separate thing of itself. But other software that ran over Quantum Link, like Habitat, which I know had its own backend and its own revival project. But how did that actually? Did it interface with the main Quantum Link disk? Did it have its own implementation of Quantum Link so inside? So there, there were there were a few possibilities. <laughs> the what the ones I call the people connection games, they were basic programs that ran entirely inside the context of people connection. The things like Rabbit Jack's Casino, they had their own stack. It was byte compatible with the Quantum Link stack, so it would just take over the modem. But it was, it, it even used a different serial interface. So, like Vice at the time couldn't run Rabbit Jack's <laughs> because the precise alignment of when the flag interrupt on the CIA is set and one of the other status bits, it was just wrong enough to what the 26 would do and Quantum Link didn't care. But uh, Rabbit Jacks did. So, oops, I'm standing on the table skirt here. Oops. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of thing. And then Super Q was very interesting. It was actually a port of some of the guts of AOL to the Commodore. The AOL used FDO as their page description language for the graphical one. The command for SuperQ's extended menus is FD. Yeah. <laughs> At least it's a guess. At least it's a guess. It's definitely not how it renders anything on the rest of the service. So, yeah. Yes. Has anybody reached out to any of the original employees of QLink and asked for help? We have not, although that brings up the one funny story. The thing that worried us all from the get go was AOL at the time we were doing most of this was still a pretty active company. And we we're always worried, you know, are they going to be okay with this? And the only contact we ever had with them was one of their system administrators emailing us and saying, hey, um, I heard about this project. How are you guys doing it? And I said, well, you know, we loaded the disk in and disassembled it in Vice and wrote a test server and sent data to it and analyzed responses. And he goes, oh, cool. I was just so glad to hear you didn't have any System 88 tapes found from a dumpster because they did, in fact, uh, believe, run on System 88 for their service, uh, IBM System 88, which was a uh, rebadged Stratus. And so that's the only contact we ever had with anybody from Planet that I'm aware of, although there might have been a, there might have been a Planet employee on the Petsky forums that helped with a couple of answers. I don't remember right offhand, but not like in any huge, I've got the documentation in the trunk of my car. I might drop it off behind a building somewhere, <laughs> which is not something we'd want because yeah, you know, the way we're doing it, it's not likely to upset anybody. Although Habitat has got the official development manuals for Quantum Link and they seem to be fine with that. 
And I'm like, well, you know, that's Lucasfilm, which is now Disney. And if no one's coming after them, they're probably fine with it. <laughs> Anything else? Silence. Well, I think maybe that wraps it up. Unless someone's got anything else. Oh, one. Okay. I, I just had a thought. Um, is there any way that you could make a translation layer between BBS doors and QLink, maybe far down the line, so that because for for those middle ground people that you were talking about, they want the convenience as well as the retro one. BBS doors kind of strikes that balance. I, I, I've not looked enough at Commodore BBSs to know if you could do that, although it would be very interesting to be able to load some of the People Connection games as a BBS door yeah. and then play those over the BBS. Well, I wasn't talking about just Commodores. Like uh, Synchronet, it's a popular BBS software. Those are kind of universal, so whatever, it, it'll morph to the screen of the device. And if you could write it as a BBS door, then any platform could use QNet. That's an interesting idea, is to recreate the entire client. Um, I don't know that's what we're setting out to do at this point, but I think you know that's, that's probably something that's certainly doable. Although, if you've ever seen the text-based Gopher clients, they look a lot like Quantum Link, to the point that I've really wondered who was looking at who. Because I, it was the timing is right on the edge of when Gopher was released to be either the people that wrote Gopher were Quantum Link users that said I kind of like this interface, or the people that wrote Quantum Link may have looked at Gopher and said, "Well, let's run this on a 64." So yes, you entirely could recreate that type of thing. It's just we don't have any original content, uh, any of the original content, so it's like it's tough to fill it out that way, to flesh it out. Ah, yes. Do you mind if I make a comment? Yeah. Um, just in case people were interested, there is actually a public Quantum Link Reloaded service running at QLink.net today. Yeah, and that they, that I think, is that still using Jim Brain's original yeah. server? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, that's because I know he, he, I was talking to him upstairs and he's like, yeah, I kind of moved on to other projects, but he's now interested in working on it again and I'm now interested in working on it again. So we'll see if we can, you know, do some more enhancements that software because it's definitely things that weren't finished when i was taking the screenshots for this i did get it to hang the client at one point and I just said waiting for disk load and i'm like but i know what that is too <laughs> so there's definitely work to be done just on kind of stabilizing what's there but then i think I don't know if we ever got the people connection games implemented and they're kind of fun. Although until you get a critical mass, games don't help so you. They do work on some limited you know, the simple games do work in people connection. Okay. Usually the losers um, client session will crash at the end of the game or it will crash. Yeah, okay. So there is definitely uh, definitely work to be done. Yeah. I, I did look because uh, I if if you can get Super Q working, you can get Puzzler working, and I loved Puzzler. Super Q works in a limited fashion, yeah. so long as you don't fuck with the menus. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah, it's that there's a whole separate command language in there for setting those menus up in Super Q, and I just suspect from it's a very differently written piece of software. It's written by a more modern programmer it does not have the quantum link state machine in it it's very linear so once you start understanding it you understand large swaths of it at a time whereas the main quantum link client you can really fight for every command that you're getting with the tools we have now okay you, you 
mentioned Raymond Day. He was here yesterday. Oh, was he? Oh, yeah. okay. I, I did not. I've only ever seen the name on the screen, yeah. um, so I wouldn't have recognized him. He's been him. to the show for a number of years, but he, he showed up and okay. he was here yesterday. Oh, shit, I would like to meet him. Because there's, yeah, w without his logs, we never would have gotten huge chunks of it. The text files, they all let you like go to, go to the documentation or go to the next message or go to the previous message. And it's like, how do you set those? The client just says, and it was in his logs. Oh, here's the secret command that comes along and sets those links, enables those features. So, yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? I don't see anybody else. Okay, well, thank you guys.